All right, if you're here to learn how to build Rally apps and extend our platform with JavaScript, you are in the right spot. In this short video, I'm going to give you an intro and a great kickstart to building apps. My name is David Thomas. I'm a systems engineer on the sales team here at Rally Software. I currently live out in Santa Cruz, California, just a few blocks from the ocean. I'm a classically trained uh, software engineer, and I say that because I can empathize, after 15 years now of writing software, I can empathize with some of the challenges around writing software, the amount of time it takes to deal with SDKs and APIs, and really just having a desire to get something done in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time. So I've had an opportunity to work with our customers uh, in the field as well as with customers during our rally-sponsored hackathons over the years. And over several hackathons that I've participated in, one thing stood out. The folks that came to these were passionate about their, the work they do, they love using Rally, they want to extend Rally. They're not programmers by day. Now they're technical, they can look at code, they can extend code, write code, but they don't want to be spending 40 hours a week um, writing software. So the basis for putting this the video together and the series that'll come that'll follow is to help folks spend as little amount of time necessary to build apps on our platform. Have fun at it and be successful at it. So the purpose, written in a user story statement, is uh, as a Rally customer, I want to be comfortable extending the Rally platform to provide our business with unique insights into our own data. And the acceptance criteria that I put together for this is I want you to know where to find existing apps, either by Rally proper or, or through uh, the community, so that you can extend them. Know where to find help and resources so you can help yourself. Uh, this video in the series was, is one example of that. Um, I want you to be very comfortable in being able to start a brand new app in three minutes or under or less. Be able to have the right tools in place to drop in and just start, start writing code. I also want you to feel comfortable trying, failing, debugging, and learning. Right? If you haven't used JavaScript in a while, um, it can be frustrating at times, but as long as you're comfortable getting in, trying the code, let it fail, understand how to debug it, right, <clears throat> and figure out what went wrong, um, having a, a comfort factor there is very important so you don't give up. And lastly, I want you to feel overwhelmed with possibilities. Um, and what the SDK can do for you as opposed to being overwhelmed with stress. Okay, to kick things off, um, the number one place you need to remember for doing app development is app development is developer.rallydev.com. This is the one-stop shop portal for um, uh, app development. I'll go here briefly. Uh, you can see there's a couple things I'll point out here, at least on the right here, you can see um, where to get stuff on GitHub, we'll talk about that, getting the tools for building apps, here's the, the SDK itself, the link to the SDK, a lot of great stuff in here. This is where you'll want to start off. Now a quick note about, a couple notes about the API and the SDK, a little bit of definition here. The first thing is that you'll see uh, what we call the Web Service API, or Wasapi, as it's affectionately known. Um, and these, these docs are taken right from their own pages, so I didn't make any of this up, but the current version of our web service API, it's a REST-based API that transmits data in JSON format that's down in the weeds. So at the, at the end of the day, the web service API is the, the front door to Rally, to your subscription in Rally, to, getting, to putting data in and getting data out programmatically. Building on top of that is what we're calling the SDK, um, the app SDK. The App SDK allows you to write apps and extend and customize your subscription. You get all the buttons, the pull downs, the theming, the, all the look and feel and all that good stuff. That's what the SDK provides for you. And, that, and, and those apps are written in JavaScript. Now it's important to know that the SDK sits on top of, if you will, uh, and relies on the web service API for the actual transmission of data in and out of Rally. It just wraps it nicely and makes it easy to use. Another note is that the SDK is based on a, um, a framework by Sencha called XJS. You'll see that term, in, all, that term um, in various places. But XJS is just a framework, like many that are out there. Um, we use it internally, and, and you can use it through our SDK. It's a fantastic framework. It made me fall in love with JavaScript again. Um, but 
what's, what's interesting to know is that the, the app SDK and the center framework, this is used by Rally Engineering to build Rally itself. So you, you're using the same components that we use to build, uh, to build Rally. Now, just a quick disclaimer. Uh, I'm not an expert. I've been doing this for a long time, but I'm not an expert, and I learn every single day just like you. Uh, I'm very passionate about what I do. I believe in Rally and the value that it brings to, to our customers. Um, and, uh, and this is my story for getting you kickstarted. So, why am I doing a series of videos? Well, it turns out, and I mentioned I've been doing uh, many hackathons with our customers over the years. Um, during one of the early hackathons, I paired up with a firmware engineer who had never written in JavaScript. Now, clearly a, a, a fantastic uh, and, and um, very technical with languages like C and C++, um, but had never used JavaScript or any into the sort of the browser-based programming and all the UI and layouts and stuff like that. So we had two days to code together. And on off the cuff, I just said, hey, look, let's go to the whiteboard. And this is actually a real picture, and that's actually the guy. Thanks, Rally Marketing, for capturing that photo. It's pretty fun to find it. Um, I said, let's just go to the whiteboard. Let's talk about three things. And as we're walking over, I'm trying to think of what those three things would be. So what I'm going to walk through here in the next several slides are those three things. I can't guarantee that they're going to work for everybody. Um, I hope they work for you. They certainly work for us um, because the individual here um, actually spent that entire two days coding the entire app themselves with me just uh, as a coach and as an advisor um, and, uh, and a pair, uh, a programming pair. We had a lot of fun, and that app is still in use today at, at, uh, at his organization. So with that, this is your kickstart. Okay, number one. And let's just put out there, I'm assuming you, uh, if you don't know JavaScript, there's plenty of, re plenty of resources for JavaScript. Um, you might have not seen JavaScript in a while. That's kind of where we'll pick, up, we'll pick up with this. But when you're looking at JavaScript code, you'll see uh, a syntax and a notation that really has to do with JavaScript objects. And the, 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 the first of three tips here is that JavaScript objects are just a bunch of name value pairs. Period. You'll be looking at pages and pages of just all this nesting in of braces and colons and strings and, and um, uh, parentheses and just trying to figure out what it all is. But if you step back and just say name value, name value, name value, it starts to bring some clarity to it. Now I went online and I looked at, uh, I just went looked up JavaScript objects and the first page that came up was the W3 schools. and. W3 schools page, uh, but basically it sums it up nicely. Everything in JavaScript is an object. In addition, in JavaScript you can create your own objects. And I'll show you an example there. But everything is an object. Booleans, numbers, strings, dates, arrays, everything. Okay, There's some great documentation on objects here. Typically though what you'll see in a, is you'll see object, the name of the object, dot property name. Okay, so Let's go back and look at an example of that. So here in this first one example, I've got uh, var empty object equal open brace, open brace, close brace. That's an empty object. It doesn't do anything. It's a bona fide object as far as JavaScript is concerned and how the browser interprets it. It doesn't do much, but that's valid syntax. The more interesting one is when I put together here, I created my own object called all about me. It's got things like shoe size, name, favorite tools, etc. And you can see some of the values like our, uh, in, uh, uh, numbers, strings, like my name, uh, here's an array of strings, uh, like my favorite tools. Now, objects can also be values. So in this case, I've got a, in the all about me object, I've got a, a property called um, a location, and the value is another object. The location has zip code, city, and state. And in this sort of fictitious example, state is its own, another object, short name and full name. So you can nest these down. But you can see pretty easily, even with just a simple example kind of contrived, is that in real code, it can start to get pretty deep, and you're trying to figure out where you are, and you kind of get lost. But if you just sit back and just remember, name, value, name, value. Another interesting one is this age one, is, in, is that uh, the values can also be functions. So you can call a function, give it some properties, and it will return the value. Now I'm actually going to go do something kind of fun here. If we go in, we'll talk about tools in another in the next video. But if I go and drop into the console, JavaScript console, paste in the all about me code, what you'll see is if I say all about me, if I just type that and hit enter, it'll say, hey, you are an object. And sort of sniffing around here, you can see it, my shoe size, my name, uh, location, actually no tools, which is an array of 
four things. Here's a location was an object. I expand that and you can see state. State was another object. So you can see it has this nice little tree, nested, nested tree of, of data. So I can do things like all about me dot shoe size. Enter 10.5. True. I can do um, all about me dot location which was an object. So we'll go dot location and then one more dot will go into dot state. Dot state. And it is an object and has short name and full name. And I can go even further and say short name. So you can see with this dot notation how I can reference in, in this nested tree. Um, notice there was also that function called age here. Age takes two uh, parameters. Now what's interesting, I'll do like I'll do all about, about me dot location dot age. Now if I just do that, it's gonna say, hey, I am a function. Great. But I actually want to call the function. So I have to call it. Uh, current years 2013, born on, I was born in 1975, and I'll call the function and it'll calculate the result 38, which is correct. Okay, so at the end of the day, let's just keep, keep in mind, objects are a bunch of name value pairs when you're looking at a sea of code. Number two, we're going to talk about a little bit about XJS, that framework from Sencha that, we, that the Rally SDK uh, builds upon. There is a... Uh, um, the, the framework is deep. There's a lot to it. If, as you start looking at the Sencha docs and the guides, you'll see there's some amazing, awesome stuff that Sencha provides out of the box. But when you're writing apps, um, you can kind of, you know, it'll take some time to learn that, depending on the, the depth of how much detail you want to get into the Sencha framework. But the way that we've set, set up um, sort of app development is you'll create a bunch of components, like you'll create some drop downs, like maybe you'll have like the, um, you'll have like the defect severity drop down, the defect priority drop down, and you'll wire up those so that when someone clicks on it, it'll um, force a chart to redraw, maybe a cumulative flow chart or something. So you've got like two pull downs and a chart. Those are three components and you put them inside of a container. So in a lot of the code that you'll see, you'll see basically create a, create a container, drop in a bunch of stuff, tell the container how to lay it out, like lay those things out horizontally or vertically. And Sencha, the Sencha framework, takes care of all of the rendering and the lifecycle management, all that stuff. So when you look at app code, it's just like, hey, I built a widget, or I built a, a component or a widget, whatever you call it. Built a component, built a component, add, 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 done. And the, and the app will just turn on when you, uh, and fire up and light up when you when you paste it in. So, so the Sencha framework takes care of a lot of that um, sort of the visual artwork and layout and display stuff, which is actually quite nice. So just think about components and containers. And it's really neat because as you start to build up complex layouts, you might have a container that has two containers inside, and then that container has like the buttons, and this other container has like two charts, um, and you start to nest these things in, and uh, you can start build, building some really powerful complex uh, layouts. Okay, that was number two. Number three, which is the most fun one. This has to do purely with purely with JavaScript. It has nothing to do with our SDK. It's a very complex, nebulous concept that really throws people for a loop. And I'm hoping that in this probably the tenth attempt that I have here of explaining what scope is and this variable, I hope this helps you. It's a little bit long here, but I, I urge you to really understand what's going on with this um, concept. <laughs> Uh, because it will, if you don't, it will make it'll make coding in JavaScript frustrating, um, and you don't want that frustration to, to blend into the Rally your experience with Rally because Rally this is really nothing to do with Rally. But anyway, so here's an example. Let's do a little storytelling. Imagine yourself standing in your driveway next to your car. Right? You walk outside, stand next to your car, and I say, "What color is the ground?" And you respond, "Well, it's gray. It's cement." And then I say, "Well, why don't you hop in your car and now tell me what, what color the ground is?" So you sit in your car and you see the floor mats and you say, well, they're black. And while you're sitting in the car, you turn your music on. So imagine there's a function called this.getGroundColor. Very generic. In the above example, the context, or what we're calling this, was relative to wherever you happen to be standing or sitting. Okay. So when you execute function calls, they all sort of have this context. Um, in the example of being in your, outside your car or inside your car, the context was either the outside, being outside the car, or being inside the car. And that's what this, this is referring to. So let's take another example. In your app, let's say you have you see a method called, uh, or a function call that says this.getName. So this is pointing to something. I don't know where it is yet, and it's going to call method getName. Now, 
if you're in a top level, if you if you happen to be executing code at the top of your level of your app, that might return and say my cool app because it's the name of your app because this points to the actual app itself. But if you're down in the in the weeds of code and you're in like an on click function of a button, and you see this dot get name, that same line of code might return the string the click me button. So it's the exact same line of code but two different results, all because it depends on where you are and what the this name is referring to. Now what gets really cool is that you can force and change what the this variable points to. And it's, it's so common you have to understand this. Trust me. All right, so let's continue again. Let's go through that same example. I ask you, you're standing outside your car, I ask you what color the ground is. You say, but this time I say, why don't you get in your car, but daydream, close your eyes and daydream about standing outside while you get in your car. And then I ask you, what color is the ground? And because you're in this daydream state and you're thinking about the outside, you say, well, it's gray, it's, uh, it's cement. And while you're sitting in the car, you still turn on your music. Now, in that example, when you got in the car, you retained a reference to being outside, even though you're physically in the car. It's very common in JavaScript when you're calling other functions, you, you instruct that function, you, you tell it what it's this will be, right? So just as you got in the car and you said this will not be the car, which is natural, what it would naturally be, you're going to say that this is actually outside. And you're going to pass in that context. Um, sometimes in the way that you design apps, you kind of have this sort of global variable notion. Um, so you're always, you always kind of see passing in the, the, the this that references your app. You're always passing that in um, to functions because you want those functions, you want those pull downs, those buttons to be able to refer back to the app itself because the app is going to have a, all sorts of great functions and, um, uh, and methods and workflows that are part of the experience for the user. Because you want to kind of keep, as you'll see, you want to kind of keep that, that major workflow up there and not nested way deep. So you always want to, when you get down to a button and the person clicks on it, you want to be able to go launch, you know, tell the chart to refresh, and you have to be able to get back up to the app level to do that, to reference other things. So you're constantly passing into this to, to force the, uh, the context to change. Okay? If you don't do that, this variable is 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 everywhere. It's it's uh, omnipresent, if you will, in in your in your app. But if you don't change it, if you don't pass, give it new values, it it will. If you're down in the code of, uh, in the button logic, and you say you know uh, this dot get name, it'll say hey, I'm just a button. This points to a button. Okay, you don't have any context, or you can't point out to a, a greater context. Now what's interesting is in both cases you were uh, physically sitting in the car and you were able to turn the music on, right? Um, what you'll also see is that it's very common, wherever you are in your code, you'll also have a, a reference to the actual component you're in. So even though you've, you might be changing the, the value of this, so you have access to, to a, a, a different context, um, you also have access to the actual component that you're in. So in the second case where you, you changed your context and you're still pointing the out, being outside the car, but you're still talking, turning the car on, you would have had to have said something like car dot turn on music to be explicit that you're in the car, because had you said this dot turn on music, um, in the first example, it would have been fine because this was pointing to the car. That's natural. But in the second example, you said no. Let's let's make this point to outside. So if I'm in the car and I say this dot turn on music, it's like nope. This is pointing to outside. There's no concept of turning on the music. Okay. Um, it takes patience to get through this. I hope this example gave you some a little bit of clarity and kind of um, with the storytelling kind of help uh, um, um, think a little bit differently about it. But it's very important to understand um, the, this variable and what it points to. You'll see it all the time. Okay. At the end of the day, those are the three things um, for kickstarting. JavaScript objects are just a bunch of name value pairs when you're trying to navigate a sea of code. Um, the Ext framework gives you a really nice, easy way to create components, add them to containers, and they just light themselves up. You don't have to think too hard about it. And then under, and that was the second one. And then the third one was understand uh, scope and the, the notion of this. Okay. A couple things to wrap up here. Uh, one thing to point out is that we are big users of GitHub. Uh, it's a place for source control management. And... There are a couple of places out there, uh, Rally Apps, 
uh, there's a rally app organization. Like you see a link down here, github.com slash rally apps. You go there, you'll see, actually just go there, pull it up here. You'll see in this particular uh, organization here, a bunch of apps <clears throat> from, uh, from rally. Okay, and you go into one like storyboard and you'll see all the files for the apps, some examples. You can see app.js, here's the JavaScript, here's the file for the, the app, right? Remember I said name value pairs, right? There's a name, colon, value, okay? Um, so that's GitHub. There's also Rally Community, which is the our customer community contributing apps. There's also a Rally Hackathon, which is all the hackathons we, we participate in. We push our, our code there, et cetera. But GitHub is a place to get code, fork it, extend it, make your own changes, and also contribute. If you want help, uh, we use Stack Overflow. That's where all of our customers come in, post questions, get responses. We have folks at Rally that respond to that as well. Uh, I actually like to go, there's a link there with stackoverflow.com slash questions slash tag slash rally. I'll show you how I get there um, right from the beginning. I go to Stack Overflow, Stack Overflow, I go to tags, and I type in rally. And there's the rally one. And that's how I get in. So certainly come in, there's lots of great q and in here, you can search for, it's knowledge base, you can search for answers to stuff that is, have already been answered. And then lastly, there are some resources. Um, the developer portal I mentioned earlier, we'll go into that in the next video in detail. There's the Sencha docs itself, great guides. Uh, you'll definitely want to look there. And then there's a, a book, if you ask folks, you know, where I started learning about JavaScript, uh, JavaScript the Good Parts by Douglas Crockford is a, is a reference that everyone says, go read this book. Just about just, just plain old JavaScript stuff. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. That's my, my video. Uh, remember, the three things, the three takeaways as you watch the next several videos, you start coding. Um, remember, name value pairs, um, the uh, X components and, and containers, and the um, scope. Okay, I hope this was helpful. Enjoy.